very, 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 very warm welcome to everyone to our second in our series um, on uh, human on freedom of religion or belief um, and development uh, that is led by the Coalition for Religious Equality and Inclusive Development, a consortium that looks at how to engage uh, development, making it more inclusive through bringing in issues of intersectionality in relation to religious uh, uh, freedoms and uh, religious minorities and those of no belief. Um, in the second of our series, we're looking at humanitarianism and freedom of religion or belief. We have a fantastic panel um, that are, have very graciously and kindly joined us from Washington with our very own Jeremy Alouche here from IDS. We will introduce them in a minute. But um, just wanted to start by saying before I, I, I came here, um, I just did a quick Google on humanitarian. And guess what were the top words that came up? So the first one, on the top list was jobs. Can you imagine <laughs> jobs? You know, it makes you wonder, is that what people think or search for? The first thing they search for under humanitarian, jobs. Um, the second was meaning. Have we so lost the plot <laughs> that the idea of who we are engaging with, we need to have a, a proper definition for. And the third was Leadership Academy, which made me no comment. Hmm. Um, and finally, the fourth was Crisis. Now, humanitarian protection featured as number seven. And this is in a context where we've just had two genocides, one in Myanmar, one in Iraq, and where the level of displacement of the Syrian people, the Congo, wherever you look, levels of displacement that are mind-boggling. And yet, the first thing on a Google search on the humanitarian is jobs. Um, at a time when, of course, our toolkits on humanitarian work are becoming more sophisticated, our searches, our indexes and indices, methodologies, uh, sophistication of needs assessments. Now, of course, these are all coming from the West. You know, more and more money being poured into this in a context of humanitarian crises where the West, in terms of its control or power over humanitarian action, is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, everything from paramilitary groups and states to uh, Russia, China, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, you name it, uh, are influencing how people are moving, and yet our money is going more and more into how do we come up with sophisticated tools uh, that, well, I'll leave it to you. But the reason what we're going to do today is we're going to look at the question of, in a context where displaced people are, uh, have multiple intersecting identities, gender, age, religion, uh, political orientation, uh, ethnicity, disability, the list goes on and on, gender, of course. Um, in a context where humanitarianism has always held the high ground. We are neutral. We do not discriminate, but it's okay for us to be gender sensitive because we need to be sensitive to the needs of women. But can we have a religion sensitive lens onto humanitarianism? Oh, no, 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 that would be partisan. We can be sensitive to gender dynamics, but we can't be sensitive to religious dynamics because that would be lack of neutrality. So in that context, we have uh, an incredible group of uh, panelists who speak from different uh, standpoints and positionings, uh, but who have all been engaging with these difficult uh, questions um, and are here to share their reflections. And what we will be doing is, for the next 50 minutes, we will hear from each of them for 10 minutes, and then we will open um, the floor for questions, debates, reflections, and so forth. Um, we're very, very privileged to have with us uh, Dr. Olivia Wilkinson, joining us from Washington. Hi, Olivia. 
Uh, Olivia is the director of research for the Joint Learning Initiative on Faith and Local Communities, uh, an incredible website with incredible resources for you to check out. She has a PhD in Humanitarian Action and Religion from Trinity College Dublin, and her research focuses on social and cultural capital in disaster response and the influence of secular and religious values in shaping humanitarian action. And she is the author of a very exciting book that we were, were about to pre-order. Uh, I'm sure this will be on my list of Christmas gifts to give to lots of people <laughs> this Christmas. It's coming out in December. Perfect timing, Olivia, thank you. And it's called Secular and Religious Dynamics in Humanitarian Response. And it's coming out with Rutledge. Um, uh, and Olivia will start with uh, interrogating this idea of humanitarian uh, assistance being secular and uh, why was it secular? What does it mean for uh, issues of neutrality, of impartiality, of do no harm? Um, and this will be followed, followed by our very own Jeremy Alouche. Uh, Dr. Alouche is a fellow at IDS, with, uh, he's a political sociologist by training. Um, and he has more than 20 years research um, and development practice experience in resource politics and conflict areas. And he will be zooming in specifically on the question, moving from Olivia, who will talk about why, why has humanitarian um, assistance struggled with the question of religion, zooming in specifically on the question of humanitarianism, humanitarianism and freedom of religion or belief. And then we will be moving on to uh, uh, Jeremy Barker, who is a senior program officer and director of the Middle East Action Team for the Religious Freedom Institute. Also, very grateful that you're joining us from Washington. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, and Jeremy has lived and worked in the Middle East since 2010, um, including many years in Turkey and northern Iraq. And he has worked in the area of rights-based relief, development and advocacy, um, extending from Iraq, Turkey, Egypt, and Morocco. And he will be zooming in further, helping us go beyond uh, humanitarianism or helping us situate humanitarianism uh, within a broader context of international relations, uh, war, um, uh, uh, foreign policy, uh, proxy wars, all of that sort of helping us zoom in from humanitarian policy per se to what does it mean in a global context. And we will be last but not least uh, having the absolute pleasure, pleasure and privilege of having Dr. Nathan Hurd, uh, who is a senior policy advisor for the US Helsinki Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe, in Europe based in Washington as well. Uh, and Nathan has just come back uh, a few hours earlier from overseas travel, so extremely grateful that you're joining us. Um, and I think he has played a pioneering role in getting bipartisan um, uh, policy uh, legislation out in the US. Can you imagine being able to contribute to bipartisan legislation at this time in the US? Um, uh, the, the legislation is uh, on the Iraq and Syria Genocide Emergency Relief and Accountability Act, which he will talk to us about, which was one way of seeking to have a folk sensitive approach to uh, engaging with people who uh, have uh, uh, experienced genocide. And he will talk to us more about why such measures are important and what does it mean for how we approach folk sensitive development and humanitarian assistance. Um, we will then uh, have a chance for us to uh, discuss and debate these issues um, amongst us. And I understand many of you have seminars and other um, lectures to go to at two. Um, but for those that want to uh, continue with us, we will um, finish at 2.30. And a warm welcome for everyone who is joining us live streaming. Um, very, very warm welcome to you. If you have any questions, do email us and we will seek to engage uh, either during the seminar or after. So without much ado, I will pass on to Olivia. Uh, and uh, Olivia, uh, over to you uh, on the struggles interrogating humanitarian assistance from a religion-sensitive perspective. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can all yes. hear you. 
And I hope you can see my slides as well. Um, so, okay, well, thank you very much. Um, so today, um, I'm giving, I guess, what is the background and start to the session. So I hope that I'll be able to give, give a good scene setting. Um, as was already mentioned, I work for the Joint Learning Initiative, which is an international collaborative research network that looks at the role of religion in humanitarian development work. And that's our website. We've got lots of resources that might be useful to you in your work and your studies. Um, so this is also the title of my forthcoming book, um, as was already mentioned too. Um, and I draw many of the ideas from the, uh, from the book. So to set the theme, um, I want to start with two very brief stories. These two examples come from my research in the Philippines looking at the humanitarian response to Sifu Haiyan. Um, the first one is um, from a person from the Philippines working in the Philippines for an international secular organization. They said to me that religion was always involved in their work on a daily basis. I'm paraphrasing, but they said, came up in their conversations with disaster affected people, and they could not imagine separating it from their work. Then, in another interview, I spoke to a person from a Western European country who had worked in the Philippines during the Typhoon Haiyan response. They said to me that religions do not come into humanitarian work, and they should not come into humanitarian work because of the humanitarian principle, which I'll get into. They felt they knew how to navigate religion in the Philippines because they had attended a religious school in Europe with Vena. So we have these two very opposite perspectives. It's not to say that everyone is like this, but I'm presenting these two quite starkly different positions to demonstrate the range. Without going into um, a lot of debate and a lot of details about how to define what is secular and religious, there are two few background concepts as well that are important for the rest of what I will present. So firstly, the category of secular and religious are not binary, as I understand them. Um, but, deeply, um, but they are deeply intertwined concepts. We have to use these words to describe the dynamics, but this is more about the gray area in between the secular and religious rather than really black or positions. These dynamics are always shifting, they vary hugely from context to context, and there is divers diversity within the um, religious and secular practice. So secondly, um, it's generally understood um, that religions are not neutral. We can see in society how they are linked to politics, to culture, to all aspects of society. However, it must also be underlined that secular positions are not neutral. It is often a mark of a secular perspective that people assume that they're neutral. Um, but in fact, forms of the secular have emerged out of historic context and your view of secular or secularism will be based on the politics of secular and secularism in the face of you know, the outworkings of secular and religious dynamics in the society you are familiar with. So these two points, it's not a binary and secularity, they're not neutral. So um, why should we think about a secular and religious dynamics in humanitarian response to all? So, um, firstly, if we ignore religious beliefs and practices, we can end up causing harm, which is opposite to what humanitarians want to do, and they in fact aim to do no harm. Um, this is a quote from a report um, from 2015 about the tsunami, and of course, the, um, the tsunami in 2005. So they said, um, at the tsunami struck in the early morning, women were dressed in whatever they were wearing indoors. Some of them were very, very unhappy with the way that service delivery was provided. Having to line up and stand in the queue without having a head start to wear was very uncomfortable for them. It was very important when we were designing what they call dignity kit or hygiene kit to put scarves in the kit. This is a straightforward enough example about what can make and how that can make humanitarians uncomfortable and inappropriate for the people they're aiming to help. Another area where this can particularly come out is in mental health and psychosocial assistance in humanitarian response. 
People's spirituality is deeply connected to how they understand their own world. So this is ignored, mental health and psychosis and choices that's become irrelevant and unhelpful. Secondly, we should also consider humanitarians themselves. This is a question of unconscious bias. As we said, taking a secular position is not neutral, but if you think you are neutral, you might not understand the harm you could do. This quote is from one of my interviews in the Philippines, as someone said to me in the International Staff Member said, that the perception that religion will be troublesome, but all would try to say that they are uh, trying to be culturally sensitive. So if humanitarians want to be culturally sensitive, but this is the in contradiction to feelings and bias that religions are only troubled from the messy. This results in humanitarians avoiding or sidestepping these messy religious practices. But coming around full circle, we see how this sidestepping approach, or yeah, ignoring approach, could then feed back into the problem we see in the first call. So um, applying this to um, the humanitarian principles. Um, I think that um, principles of neutrality and partiality are particularly relevant. So, if you're not familiar with those, neutrality is the idea that humanitarian actors must be fine. And impartiality is the idea that assistance is given based on need or love without discrimination. In my research, again, I found that humanitarian staff reported that impartiality was a defining feature of the secular approach to humanitarian response. But when I spoke to people affected by Typhoon Haiyan, they said that a lack of neutrality and impartiality was a defining feature of the secular approach to humanitarian response. People, these people thought the negative effects of badly communicated beneficiary targeting, the ties between the government and the humanitarian response, and the bureaucracy of the humanitarian system, um, and the negative effects that they associate with the secular approach. Instead, they trusted organizations, particularly the local faith organizations, to prioritize relationship building, even if their assistance was for the scale. Humanitarians assume that their secularity guarantees impartiality, and impartiality was basically the, the principle that came up, not neutrality in fact. But they did not like the way that their actions undercut this principle, and the fact that impartiality is to be least being part of interpretation. So just to finish, overall we see that humanitarians do deal with religious belief and practice on a daily basis. But going back to my very first story, it's often the national staff members who are acting as culture brokers and constantly negotiating in an ad hoc way any dissonance between the largely secular humanitarian system and standards and then the daily lived religion of people following the ad this means that it's an additional burden for local and national staff that is underreported. If the humanitarian system really wants to move towards localization, that shifting resources, the power dynamics, and more local acts, these secular dynamics must be discussed. Localization will mean working with more local factors. If the unconscious biases, fears, hesitations continue, comparing localization will make a significant number of local organizations out there and a huge part of people's daily lives. Um, so that's all, if I'm short enough. Um, thank you very much. I will try to stop presenting. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Olivia. <laughs> so, some very interesting concepts here of secularisms with an S, multiple forms of secularisms, and secularism and religion as, across the spectrum as opposed to a binary. And also, the concept of unconscious bias, I'm sure you, a lot of you have been saying invisible power, invisible power, thinking invisible power. Um, just take, I want to take this opportunity to say that very exciting work has just been released on in power, invisible power in development. Jethro Pittet is here with us. And uh, come and, to, and talk to me about invisible power in the new book that has just been released, uh, just yesterday, actually. Um, so relationship between our unconscious bias and the role of norms and values as invisible power. So moving on from those aspects of the, the exposing the, the kind of uh, dilemmas and conundrums and the, how the, the discourse does not match with the reality on the ground, vis-a-vis -vis 
the question of religions and secularisms and beyond the binaries to the question of freedom of religion or belief more specifically. So we, we have a, a humanitarian policy that recognizes gender inequalities or gender freedoms, that recognizes youth, that recognizes a wide array of inequalities. Where does humanitarianism sit vis-a-vis -vis the question of religious inequalities? Um, so Jeremy and Ush, please, on to you. Thank you very much, Marie. And shout, it's very empowering. I'm going to shout. Okay, <laughs> so, uh, brilliant. Can everybody hear me? <laughs> okay, so, um, basically what I'm going to do, uh, okay, put the slides up. I'm, I'm actually going to start, if you don't mind, with the last, last slide. Just to, for those that are not aware, I wasn't sure whether that was going to be uh, mentioned or not. But that's, that's basically, uh, for those that are not uh, involved in sort of, um, the humanitarian <coughs> field, that's the four core principles of humanitarian action. It was mentioned a bit in the previous presentation, but I just thought it was important to flag back. So, uh, humanity, impartiality, neutrality, and independence. And all of these, obviously, will have an impact in the way that one thinks about the relationships, uh, obviously in plural, uh, between religious inequalities and, and humanitarianism. So, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to come back to the beginning now. Um, so, basically, my task there was to do, um, uh, it's not based on field research, it, it, it was a, a, a mostly a sort of desk review based on sort of, uh, a set of literature reviews. There's been some very interesting material right now that has been written um, uh, basically in uh, uh, the refugee camps in, in, uh, in Jordan about how religious inequalities and humanitarians are, are being approached. I've also been basically through the sort of key global humanitarian policy reports, and there are basically two main ones. Uh, one is called the Global Humanitarian Review, and the other one is called the State of the Humanitarian uh, System. And I'm basically going through, through the analysis of this report to, to understand to what extent um, this relationship has been addressed or not. And then uh, thirdly, I also took the opportunity to look at some of the position papers by um, faith-based humanitarian ne network. Uh, in this case, it was the World Evangelical Al Alliance. Uh, the second one was um, the ACT Alliance, so the Action by Churches Together Alliance. And the third one, Isra Islamist Relief. And what were their position paper at the 2006 16 World Humanitarian Forum. The next forum will be uh, uh, in the next coming months, so uh, it would be good to sort of update and see how their position perhaps have evolved with regards to these issues. So, in terms of background, we can move to the next slide. Um, it's obviously uh, becoming uh, a, a, a bigger concern. Uh, Maurice has mentioned the sort of humanitarian crisis in the Middle East and, and Myanmar. Uh, the UK government. Uh, in the UK, I thought I'll mention it, has become uh, more vocal about these issues. But it's quite interesting, actually, going through the reports um, and some of these uh, 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 positions. Um, one event that really shifted the way uh, th these debates were formulated has very much been the Ebola crisis. And, and in some ways, it was a very technical issue. Um, it was the issue about safe burials, and most humanitarian agencies had no clue how to approach this issue. And obviously, knowing the Ebola crisis and how delicate it was to handle these bodies and what to do with these bodies and the contamination and so on, it, it created a lot of technical questions. And most of the humanitarian actors were really left with uh, unknown, uh, in, in sort of unknown field. It wasn't covered by their guide on how to approach the question of safe burials and so on. It created a lot of discussion about um, how to approach um, this, this relationship between uh, more sort of religious and spiritual issues. But as I'll see, although I don't have much time, uh, the issue has been very much, again, instrumentalized and very much through a sort of much more technical lens. Okay, the, 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 there has been also quite a policy shift in uh, the UNHCR uh, position. Um, uh, and in 2012, uh, it organized its first meeting 
its first meeting, can you believe that? 2012, first meeting to discuss uh, religion and re refugee protection. And it was stated that, you know, it, it's an important challenge and that the future is, <coughs> quote, uh, working in multi-religious humanitarian setting where displaced communities belong to different religious groups and the dilemmas that it creates. Okay, so we got, we got a, 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 a sort of emerging consciousness around the issue, but what, does it, what, what, what were my findings when looking through uh, the different discourses and the reports that I've uh, looked at? Well, mostly, you know, in a nutshell, it's still completely ignored. Um, and um, I'm going to try and explain uh, a, a few reasons why. So, uh, obviously, the first one that comes to, to, to our mind is what was discussed in the previous um, uh, discussion, in the previous presentation, essentially about, well, <coughs> we're talking about a, a, a very distinctive secular humanitarian regime, and to what extent religious issues can be covered. Um, so I've got a, a, a quote there, essentially by an sort of NGO manager that was um, picked up in the report that when it was looking at to what extent these four principles are still core principles in, in, in the way we intervene. And this NGO is saying, a uh, manager basically saying, losing impartiality and neutrality would be the worst mistake we humanitarians could make. We have access to places only because we do good work and people know that we don't have a political position. And there's been a very, very small minority. Uh, I, I think there was a, a survey that was done with humanitarian practitioners coming like over 1,000 humanitarian practitioners. And a tiny, tiny minority started to question to what extent the principle of neutrality has not it, uh, uh, many shortcomings. Okay, I can't go too much in detail, but just um, one. The, the, the second aspect, obviously, that's linked to that is to what extent it, it has become, it is, it is really a taboo. Uh, religious identity becomes a taboo. And what I want to argue, basically, is that <coughs> it is astonishing that if you look at most of these reports, um, there's no data that you can find on religious identities. Um, uh, and in some ways, uh, from another article I was reading, uh, I thought it was a very nice uh, way of summarizing the thinking, is that we're talking about the secular, the secular material and homogeneous <laughs> refugees. We, 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 we simplify the way that uh, uh, how refugees define, essentially according to its own needs, basically. So, access to water, access to housing, access to health, and that's it. That's the refugee. It, it's got no particular identity. Um, that's why I say this on UNCR, uh, in some ways, in its management of these camps, talks about essentially about the physical and material needs. Um, okay, and then we can move on to another aspect, which is uh, one of the important discourse, which is essentially that religion is a personal rather than a public matter. Um, and there we got another quote from uh, P Patrick and Susan Farley uh, that was quoted in, a, in an article that I read. Um, that our charity office is actually from a faith-based uh, uh, organization, which is interesting. It's actually interesting, just to sideline, how faith-based organizations are buying in, actually, into the secular uh, domain to be included as part of it. Um, so there the quote basically says, well, the subject of religion never comes up in our work. We don't know the religion of the birth initiaries. It doesn't matter to us. And why should you need to care about religion? I mean, sure, we rarely see anyone who is not Muslim. Uh, but really, no one cares what the religion of a person is. It's a principle of charity. We should not discriminate. And I think the, the, the idea, the broader idea there is that in the name of actually uh, neutrality, we just assume that tolerance and, and respect will emerge. So just to conclude, um, uh, I think what I've been trying to argue in these short 10 minutes, and by the way, the, the, the report will be available if you want much more details about it very soon, the, 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 the sort of neutrality leads to a sort of depolitization of the conflicts and power sort of intersectional dynamics. And it's really interesting actually, when you look at these reports, the causes of this conflict are never analyzed or discussed. The only way that it's discussed is essentially through environmental matters, mm -hmm. uh, to the ecology, uh, because in some ways it doesn't touch anybody. There, there's a neutrality that can be respected. If we blame it on climate change or El Nino, that's, that's fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, but at the same time, it is 
uh, really essential that one works on these issues because um, most of the research that has been done in conflict resolution and peace building uh, basically found that sort of ignoring dynamics of religious pluralism can become a source of conflict if not addressed sensitively. So that's why it's really crucial that uh, op one opens up the debates around these questions. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. concepts here for us to think about because you spoke about humanitarian regimes the word regime uh, the idea of governmentality the idea of ideology in a regime uh, organizational power is very very important the second is assumptions that uh, and this builds on the point that Olivia said that humanitarian actors assume that they are seen as neutral they assume that people see them as you know uh, totally impartial, with no political uh, or hidden agendas or whatever. Um, and the third point is the point, I think, which I find very interesting, Jeremy, that about the fact that um, it's not just secular humanitarian actors that uh, give the semblance of uh, we are religion blind, that also faith-based actors can be blind to religious inequalities. Do you all remember when we lived under the myth that just because you're a woman, you were uh, automatically assumed to have a gender, egalitarian agenda, or that you'd be a feminist? And it took us decades to realize, actually, that is not the case. You can be a woman, and you can be totally gender blind, and you can be in favor of policies that go against women's equality or women's choice. And the same thing here, the fact that um, you can be a religious actor or a, or a secular actor, humanitarian actor, and, it, and you can still be blind to how religious inequalities play out in the context in which you work. So on to the last point that you mentioned, Jeremy, which is um, when you talk about um, conflict resolution and you almost slipped into the political settlements. You know, it's not just about the extension of assistance, it's about how this will all play out in the broader reconfiguration of power. And Jeremy, you're going to be speaking to this, that we can't, you know, it's easy for us to try and tidy up humanitarian assistance policies, but actually they're happening in the context of proxy wars, of very, very fluid uh, demarcation of national borders, of arms trades, of uh, 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 other actors beyond the conventional Western actors. It's not just the U.S. hegemonic kind of uh, global power, um, you know, uh, and its proxies anymore. We're talking here about broader configurations at a massive scale. Um, and Jeremy, can you please speak to us a little bit about situating humanitarian assistance in that global uh, picture and how it actually plays out in a micro picture? Uh, from your own experience in working in settings where these dynamics are in place? Yes, um, well, it's a, a big topic you've given me. So <laughs> <laughs> ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> to try and go within ten minutes, we'll, we'll see. Um, but I, I do hope to, to be able to, to make a little bit of a turn from uh, some of the theoretical points and, and then apply it into um, particularly kind of front of mind will be the situation um, in Iraq and religious minorities there was was just back there about two weeks ago and to have been working there extensively over the last five years. Um, and I will just make one um, reference to um, a resource that um, actually Maria and Nathaniel, uh, you were there with us as well, just up the road from, from right now at that Wilton Park about a year ago. Um, there was a conversation on assisting religious minorities in humanitarian crises. And from that came a, a Wilton Park statement, um, an outcome statement that uh, DFID and the State Department, um, or I guess the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, the FCO, and the State Department. Yes. Um, I will hold the thought on what happened with the U.S. State Department. <laughs> <laughs> and will will uh, Nathaniel? Are you okay with we jump in? on to you until Jeremy can come back to us. 
Sure. Um, yeah, um, first of all, uh, pleasure to be with all of you. Um, I, you introduced me as, uh, as a doctor. I, I assume that means that I've just been granted uh, an honorary doctorate, so, so thank you for, uh, for that. A triple doctorate. <laughs> um, just a, a quick word about uh, where I work. I work for the U.S. Health Safety Commission. Uh, it's a congressional commission made up of Democrats and Republicans from, uh, from the House and Senate. Uh, to come together to look at uh, human rights for the most part in um, all of Europe, former Soviet Union, Turkey, the United States, Canada, and, and a bit in the Middle East uh, and North Africa. And uh, so that was sort of, that's sort of the broader context of how I became involved uh, in Iraq and uh, in Syria. Many of you will recall that in uh, 2014, uh, as ISIS swept across uh, Iraq and eventually um, uh, in, in Syria, uh, it committed uh, genocide, uh, war crimes, and crimes against humanities, uh, crimes against humanity against uh, Christians, Yazidis, uh, and Shia Muslims of, of different kinds. Um, just to give you an idea of the effect of that, in uh, 2002, so just before uh, the U.S. invasion of uh, Iraq, there were uh, upwards of 1.4 million Christians in, uh, in Iraq. That number was down to 500,000 uh, just before the rise of ISIS. Uh, and as of today, it's less than 200,000. Uh, the numbers of Yazidis have, have fluctuated a bit. Uh, some of them have fled to Syria and then back. Uh, but as many of you know, uh, quite, a, quite a number of them uh, are displaced in Iraq, are refugees in the region, and are in Europe. And so in the midst of all of this, um, we had a very significant policy problem here in the United States. Uh, the previous uh, presidential administration, uh, both at the political level, uh, but also uh, to some extent uh, within the bureaucracy as well, resisted <coughs> chilly, directing humanitarian stabilization and recovery assistance to religious and ethnic minorities. Uh, picking up on some of the themes of the earlier speakers, they looked at individuals just as individuals. They didn't look at them as being part of uh, religious and ethnic communities. And they didn't look at these communities as communities per se. And so the end result was that as these communities faced an existential crisis, literally their survival as communities uh, was on the line, People making decisions about aid uh, refuse to, in a more intentional, systematic way, direct assistance to these communities so that they could survive. Uh, the rationales given were uh, humanitarian uh, principles as understood in a particular way. Uh, we'll talk about that a bit more uh, during the Q&A period. Um, there were claims that to do so would uh, it would discriminate uh, against some religious groups. Uh, it would express a preference for other religious groups. Uh, and then in the U.S. context, there were even uh, staffers and officials who would claim that this would be a violation of our Constitution, our constitutional prohibitions on sort of an official establishment of, uh, of religion. And so, as these uh, humanitarian principles were being invoked, as the, the particular understanding of our Constitution was being invoked, meanwhile, Christians, uh, these and others, uh, were literally disappearing from their ancient homelands uh, in Iraq and in Syria. Uh, there was also a bit of reluctance to uh, fund uh, investigations, criminal investigations into perpetrators. <laughs> by NGOs that were gathering evidence, collecting evidence that could be used in eventual criminal trials against, against perpetrators. And so uh, Congress, uh, as it often does when it uh, perceives uh, what it thinks is a uh, policy error on the part of the executive branch, decided that it was time for action. And so that's when I was tasked with drafting um, the legislation that uh, Maritz referred to earlier, the uh, first iteration was introduced in uh, late 2016, so just at the end of the previous Congress. We ran out of legislative days, and it was reintroduced at the very beginning of 
uh, the very beginning of 2017. Uh, it passed in June of uh, 2017, as was mentioned, overwhelming bipartisan support. Um, this legislation passed the House of Representatives uh, unanimously twice. It passed the Senate uh, unanimously as well. And strong uh, bipartisan uh, support for it. Uh, so this was not this was not a partisan issue. This is not about Democrats uh, or uh, or Republicans. Uh, and the legislation was very simple. It provided very clear, explicit authorization to the State Department, the U.S. Agency for International Development, to provide uh, humanitarian stabilization or recovery assistance to the women's and ethnic minorities in Iraq and Syria, and then refugees who have been displaced in the region who had been targeted by ISIS for a problem crimes. And I want to talk a little bit about the phrasing of the legislation. So one of the arguments that has been made about the legislation, about this general approach to assistance, is that uh, is, you know, in the US context, for example, is intended to uh, sort of be all about this. And what we would regularly tell the USA and the State Department was, we're asking to provide assistance to these people, not because they're Christians per se, not because they're Yiddies per se, but because they were targeting genocide and crimes against humanity and war crimes, mass murder, rape and other forms of sexual violence, kidnapping, the list on top. And that assistance was an essential aspect as people survive. No one was thinking that assistance should stop being provided to larger communities, uh, Sunni Muslims in the Syrian context, uh, Shia Muslims and the broader Shia Muslims in the Iraqi context, as well as Sunni Muslims who have been targeted by ISIS. What we were really arguing for was a both and pro. And it was somewhat ironic because as the administration, I think this was true of a lot of Europe, other European governments as well, in its broader foreign policy, talked about the importance of attacking pluralism, responding to the and uh, responding to math and human rights violations. Philosophically, I would you ideologically, refuse to use a system to enable these communities. Uh, to provide this people. And so that's what gave rise to the legislation. As I noted, the legislation had overwhelming bipartisan support. Uh, it was signed into the law uh, late, in, uh, late in 2018. And so I did a real sort of case study in how you can use the legislative process. I mean, we had a situation in which uh, our aid agencies had no prohibitions on being, on doing what, what Congress and all was asking them to do. And yet they still uh, There was, uh, our, in our federal budget, some line uh, four years ago that actually directed the State Department to look at these assistance, and it's doing. So that's why we felt that the legislation was necessary. So, uh, so can you will, kind of repeat the last bit again because the line here was cutting off a little bit. Apologies. Uh, about that. Sorry, I'm not uh, We had a situation in which, in the federal budget, so what we call our appropriations, in the federal budget, there was money that was appropriated and directed to be spent on uh, religious and ethnic minorities that had been targeted by ISIS for atrocity crimes. And our bureaucrats, both in the State Department and USAID, basically just ignore the law. And so that's why we thought it was essential to ensure that there was no, there was a total uh, clarity about what was permitted under the law, and so that's what gave rise uh, to this legislation. I'm happy to answer questions about the legislation. I'm happy to answer uh, questions as well about uh, some of the sort of philosophical understandings or are any misunderstandings about humanitarian principles and about US law on the part of our bureaucracy. And also, I'm hoping that during the Q&A period, uh, we can have a further discussion about how some faith-based organizations understand some of these principles and the effect that it has on, on their work. Uh, hopefully, that made sense. Uh, as was noted earlier, 
Uh, I have just been walking overseas travel. I was observing uh, parliamentary elections in, in Belarus. So if, if it sounds as if I've been speaking in a language that none of us understand, that's why. I'm a bit jet lagged right now. No, you've been very clear. Thank you, Nikki. So you, you were actually, you've answered a number of concerns that we had that. Um, that the aid would be used for preferential treatment and you're telling us actually as long as we're consistent that we support those who are targeted. So uh, in Myanmar it means that we would target and uh, we would support Muslims uh, who are fleeing into Bangladesh because they've been targeted. Um, that in another part of the world we would potentially be uh, focusing on Buddhists in India because they are targeted. It's the idea of we will be consistent in supporting anyone who has been the subject of targeting. And the second point that you um, answered to us is the potential that by adopting a form of freedom of religion or belief censored policy, we would inadvertently unleash a backlash on account of being seen as uh, giving preferential, again, treatment or uh, redirecting funds from one community to another. But you were telling us that this was not a case of taking away money from the generic reconstruction of Iraq, but actually recognizing that there are multiple needs and therefore there needs to be, in addition to that part, additional parts allocated. So it's not a case of taking from one and giving to another. Um, you also mentioned the idea of the problem of issuing a law if it doesn't have accountability with teeth. What kind of teeth uh, would enactment and enforcement um, mean in a case to make Forbes sensitive humanitarian policy not just a law or a policy but something that uh, we can account for on the ground. So thank you for that and on that note we're going back to Jeremy we, we apologize that for some reason at the mention of the US State Department and the FCO <laughs> the network uh, no, just joking. <laughs> you suggest any conspiratorial bits here. But um, let, let's go back to the points you were saying that you were trying to create a, a, an almost like a, 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 a not so much a manifesto, but a, a, a proclamation of having these two very powerful institutions recognize the need to shift from see no fob, hear no fob. Uh, to one where there is a certain recognition that there are dynamics that we can't ignore. Um, so on to that point, coming back to you, Jeremy, now. Okay, very good. I hope you can hear me now. Yeah. Okay, my apologies for that. I'm not sure what happened here. Um, but yeah, I, and the, the conversation that I was referencing in the, the Wilton Park statement, it really emerged from um, the two genocides that are in mentioned at the beginning of, of our event today of, of what's happened in, in Myanmar, particularly targeting the, the Rohingya Muslim community, um, and then in Iraq, the, the targeting of the, uh, the Yazidi and Christian minorities in particular, but also um, other smaller re religious minority groups as well. Um, and there was this recognition by the aid agencies as well as the um, FCO and the State Department as they were looking at their freedom of religion and belief um, responses of that there was a, a gap that was missing. And so that was what sparked this conversation. So I would, would point you to that statement. Um, and then the, the point that I also wanted to pick up on from, from Jeremy's presentation had to do with um, these, the humanitarian principles, and uh, particularly the first one that, that has to do with humanity and recognizing the, the human dimension of, um, of the people that humanitarian development actors are aiming to assist. Um, and to do that, I want to, to cite uh, the Pew Board, which seems to be ubiquitous in, in these conversations, on, on two fronts. The first has to do with uh, the uh, pervasiveness of religious identity. And, um, based on a, a report that came out from Pew last year, 85% um, of adults ages 18 to 39 identified with the religious community around the world. Um, and of adults ages 40 and, and over, it's 90%. Um, so very clearly a 
a significant portion of how people identify and understand themselves has to do with religious beliefs and, and religious community. The, a second factor is um, the statistic most often cited in this setting from in the view form about religious restrictions or repression. Um, and the, the latest data that's increased over the last 10 years as they've been tracking it, um, that in more than 50 countries, 56 countries, um, encompassing 86% of the world's population, there's high or very high restrictions on religion. And um, people who maybe are critics or that want to nuance that statistic would say, well, well, certainly that can't be accurate. You can't say that all 6 billion people in those countries are restricted based on the percentage. Exactly, that's, that's the point for the conversation today, is that that's, those restrictions aren't applied equally. There's inequalities that come up within those countries on the basis of um, religious belief and identity. And if our humanitarian and development programs are, are coming to reach the individual, it has to take that inequality into account. And, and often that equality, inequality is seen in, in communities and individuals that are pushed to the margins of society. Often that could be socially or politically, but in some, some cases it's often geographically as well. Um, and so it's often on the fault lines, uh, political governance divisions, um, where you see some of these communities who are the most vulnerable. And as I think in particular, the, um, the communities that I mentioned that have worked on the most recently in, in the northern Iraq, the Yazidi, and the Christian community, um, their traditional homelands are, are in Iraq's disputed territories. Those officially recognized from their constitutional process that it wasn't clear who was responsible for the governance. There would at some point be a referendum that would determine those things. The security of those communities was, was somewhat in dispute. It was shifting. And so when you have um, the attacks by ISIS in 2014, those that were left most vulnerable um, were those that were on the margins of that security structure, the, the Yazidi communities in Sinjar, the, the Christian communities in the Nineveh Plains. Um, and so that reality of the, this kind of exclusion of communities, the, those dynamics, they did emerge within the crisis, but they were exacerbated by that as stressors increase as resources become more scarce. Um, and so it's important to, to understand that as we're, we come into a humanitarian response um, that, that access to services, the, um, the security dynamics, um, they're not applied equally, and so our program has to take that into account when we're doing our situational analysis and our needs assessments and others. And, um, and this, um, Olivia, great, some great examples for how this may, might show up in a... Um, thank, thank, you, thank you, Jeremy. Sorry to cut you off, but I, I think it's a good point to stop here and then just open up for questions, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions uh, building what you're saying. So, okay, very good. Jeremy's talked about security, why it's people are not just targeted because they're members of a community, but they happen to live in areas which are, from a security point of view, uh, disputed areas, areas where um, other considerations uh, come into why they become targets. Um, and I think that's really, really important, the, the question, the, the point you're raising. Why is the Nineveh Valley where the Yazidis live and where a number of minorities live an area that is um, very, where a lot of different actors within Iraq and outside Iraq are very interested in getting their hands on in terms of uh, uh, governance? And I think that's a really important point because we're talking about freedom of religion or belief. We assume that the disputes are on just exclusively on religion, but it's about land, it's about security, it's about proxy wars, and a wide array of uh, people becoming uh, targeted because of where they're based or what they stand for um, in the middle. It doesn't mean that their identity isn't uh, important, but because of that, their identity gets shoved aside um, in those disputes. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jeremy. Much appreciated.